Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Zion on this sixth day of Christmas. You know, Christmas isn't just a single day, it's a season. It's a 12-day season that takes us from the Feast of the Nativity on December 25th to the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. 12 days of Christmas. Hmm, I think there was a song about that at one time. <coughs> Welcome. This is God's house. He's the one who invites us here into his presence. He's here to feed us in the sacrament. He's here to speak forgiveness into our lives. He's here to speak his word into our lives and to bless us with every good gift of grace. With that, we rise for confession and absolution. <laughs> Beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise for the entrance.
Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole
And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from the fourth chapter of Galatians. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the laws, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, than an heir through God. The word of the Lord. Thanks.
mercy and peace is ours this day because of Jesus the Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, again a blessed sixth day of Christmas to all of you. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six geese on lady. Today's also Christmas Eve, so a blessed Christmas Eve to all of you as well. New Year's Eve is often a time for us to think about both this past year and the year to come. And often we find ourselves a bit conflicted. We see in this past year both blessings and perhaps some disappointments. And we come into this new year with both eagerness and perhaps a little bit of trepidation. We find ourselves filled with longing, longing for another chance at missed opportunities last year, longing for no missed opportunities in this coming year. But all three of our readings this morning remind us not to get too fixated on our sense and feelings of longing, for in a very real way, in Jesus, this babe of Bethlehem, our deepest longing has been fulfilled. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Isaiah reminds us, because of this Christ child lying in a manger, we've been clothed with the garments of salvation. The robes of his righteousness are ours. We have a new name and a new identity. We're a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of our God. Our deepest longing for a right relationship with God has indeed been fulfilled. And in our epistle reading this morning, Paul reminds us that God sent his son into our world at just the right time to rescue us from the law's accusation, to save us from our sin. Because of Jesus, we're sons and daughters of the King. Yes, our deepest longing for a right relationship with God has indeed been fulfilled. And in our gospel reading this morning, we see Jesus presented in the temple, redeemed from the Lord, just as the law required. And we see Simeon take the baby Jesus in his arms. He knows beyond all doubt, this tiny baby nestled in his arms is the one who indeed fulfills our deepest longing. O oh Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Yes, beloved, in Jesus, our deepest longing has been fulfilled. So let's dig deeper. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 61st chapter. Throughout this season of Advent and Christmas, we've been singing songs. And our Old Testament reading this morning gives us another song to sing. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Beloved, Isaiah's song here in our Old Testament reading this morning becomes Simeon's song in our gospel reading this morning. And these two wonderful songs are held together by doxology. Both of these songs sing God's praise, 
Praise for what God has done. Praise for God's faithfulness. Praise for who God is. Praise for what he does in our lives. He fulfills our deepest longing. He clothes us with his salvation. He brings his righteousness to the world. And beloved, if that's not worthy of praise, I don't know what is. I delight greatly in the Lord. My whole being rejoices in my God. Beloved, did you notice the two metaphors Isaiah uses here? The first metaphor is a marriage metaphor. It's an image of love, tender love, love that's wholehearted and unconditional, love that cares deeply for the other, love that truly wants the best for their spouse. Yes, beloved, Jesus is our bridegroom. He loves us just like a bridegroom loves his bride. Jesus, our bridegroom, has gifted us the garments of salvation. In the words of John's revelation, our robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. He lived his life for us. He died his death for us. His righteousness is now our righteousness. The second metaphor takes us out to the garden. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The image here is of germination. Dead seeds are planted in the dirt. Dead seeds come alive. They sprout and grow. In the very same way, God is on the move, making all things new. In Jesus, he takes what's dead and brings it to life. Beloved, once we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but now we're alive in Christ. Again, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. And that gift of righteousness that's ours through the life, death, and resurrection of this babe of Bethlehem fills our mouth with praise. Beloved, listen to who we are because of Jesus. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all the kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Oh, beloved, that's who we are. We're a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. We're his royal diadem. We're his beautiful radiant bride without any stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. This is who we are. Because of Jesus, born the babe of Bethlehem, our deepest longing is fulfilled. We're sons and daughters of the King. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and dressed me in a robe of his righteousness. And that brings us to our epistle reading this morning in Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fourth chapter. Beloved, Paul never ever writes anything about the birth of Jesus. However, he does speak profoundly about the meaning of our Lord's birth. And our epistle reading this morning is just one powerful example of this. Here in Galatians 4, Paul talks about God sending his son into our world within the larger context of what it means to be children of God and co-heirs with Christ in terms of eternal life. You see, beloved, these Galatian believers had been told if they really, really wanted to follow Jesus, 
then they needed to follow all of the Jewish laws. They had to be circumcised. They had to prepare kosher food. They had to keep all of the Sabbath laws. They had to follow everything the law required. But in Galatians chapter 3, the chapter prior to our reading this morning, Paul argues God's promise to Abraham takes priority over the law. The law served its purpose. God used it to restrain sin. But beloved, the law has absolutely no power at all to fulfill our deepest longing. The law has no power at all to save us from our sin. So the law was our disciplinarian until Jesus came into our world. He does for us what the law can never do. He fulfills our deepest longing. He saves us from our sin. In Him, we're free from sin. We're now God's children who live our lives by faith in Jesus. And this gospel good news is true for Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, men and women alike. In baptism, we all belong to Jesus. We're all one in Christ, all heirs of God's promises in Christ. Then at the beginning of chapter 4, just before our reading this morning, Paul expands on what it means to be an heir. When heirs are still minors, Paul argues they're really no better than slaves because as minors, they and their property, the property they'll inherit, remain under the control of guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So too with us, says Paul. While we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. And then in the verses immediately after our reading this morning, Paul says, formerly, when you didn't know God, you were slaves to those who by nature aren't gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? So from Paul's perspective, the Galatians choosing to live their lives according to the Jewish law instead of living their lives in gospel freedom isn't any different than going back to their previous paganism. For Paul, both the Jewish law and paganism lead to the very same place, slavery. But, says Paul, but when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. And why did God send his son to be our savior? So we might receive adoption to sonship. And beloved, being sons and daughters of the king makes all the difference in the world. Being sons and daughters of the king fulfills our deepest longing. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of the king, says Paul, God sent his spirit into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, Daddy. So we're no longer slaves, beloved. We're God's children. And because we're God's children, we're heirs of eternal life. God's kingdom is ours now and for all eternity. All because God sent his son into the world at just the right time to fulfill our deepest longing. To bring us into relationship with him here and now and to keep us in relationship with him forever. And that brings us at last to our gospel reading this morning in Luke, the second chapter. Beloved, in our gospel reading this morning, we see Mary and Joseph attending to some very important business. 
In the very same way, Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem to be counted in Rome's census. Now, here in our reading this morning, they traveled to Jerusalem to fulfill the Jewish requirements for purifying Mary after giving birth to Jesus and for presenting a newborn baby to the Lord. You see, from God's perspective, because of the Passover in Egypt, every firstborn male belonged to him. They were consecrated to the Lord. But these firstborn boys could be redeemed. They could be bought back from the Lord. The price was five sanctuary shekels. And this redemption ceremony was really quite simple. The temple priest spoke two words of blessings over the child. The first blessing praised God for the law of redemption. God's mercy and grace at work in the life of this child, in the life of his family. And then the second blessing, praise God for the gift of a firstborn son. Then the parents paid the shekels, and with that, the redemption ceremony was complete. However, the rite of purification for a new mother was a bit more complicated. Giving birth is a bloody event. And according to Jewish law, the blood of childbirth made a woman ritually unclean. So she needed to be purified. And this rite of purification required two sacrifices. A sin offering to get rid of the spiritual uncleanness associated with the blood of birth. And a burnt offering marking the restoration of the mother's relationship with God. Once these two sacrifices were offered, then the new mother was free to return to worship. The sin offering was always a tithe. However, if the family had some means, then their burnt offering would be a lamb. But if the family was poor, then their burnt offering was a second dove. Luke tells us Mary and Joseph offered two doves for her purification. Beloved, the day will come when this baby now cradled in his mother's arms will become the very Lamb of God whose sacrifice on the cross will take away the sins of the world. He will buy us back from sin, death, and the power of Satan. He will purify us. His blood shed on the cross will make us white as snow. Now Mary and Joseph may not have understood what was in store for their child. But there were others in the temple that day who did. Luke tells us there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Simeon was filled with longing. How he longed to see God's Messiah with his very own eyes. And the Holy Spirit told him he wouldn't die until he had indeed seen the Messiah. So every day he went to the temple courts. Every day he looked for a certain baby boy. And every day that passed only deepened his longing. His longing to hold the Messiah in his arms. And then it happened. Simeon sees Mary and Joseph. He sees the baby Jesus in Mary's arms. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he knows this baby is indeed the Messiah. Full of reverence and awe, full of wonder and joy, Simeon takes the baby Jesus into his arms and breaks into song. Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you may now let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. With this Christ child nestled in his arms, 
his deepest longing has indeed been fulfilled. And Simeon, with prophetic vision, sees this child's future. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Yes, this beautiful baby nestled in Simeon's arms will one day be mocked and beaten, scourged and ridiculed and nailed to a cross. There will be those who stand at the foot of the cross and weep as they watch him die. Their hearts will indeed be revealed. But so will those who stand there shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Mary will indeed be standing there as well, her soul pierced as she watches her son suffer and die. But beloved, the cross isn't the end of this story, is it? And there's another person here in the temple whom the Holy Spirit gives eyes to see. Her name's Anna. She's an elderly widow who never left the temple. She's always there worshiping, fasting, praying. She too sees the baby Jesus. She too is so full of longing. She too recognizes this baby is her savior. She too comes to hold this baby in her arms. She thanks God for the gift of this baby. And then she tells everyone gathered there that day, this is no ordinary baby. No, this baby is the one who fulfills our deepest longing. This baby is our savior, our redeemer, our Lord. Beloved, one final thought. One of the things I love about this gospel reading this morning is this. There are several characters here in this story, Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna, and all of the other people in the temple that day. But throughout this story, beginning to end, Luke keeps Jesus at the very center of this story. He's right here in the middle foreground. From Luke's perspective, Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna are never meant to be our focus. Yes, they have a story to share, but they're always, always pointing us to Jesus. This baby never makes a sound in our story this morning, not even a whimper. And yet everything Luke describes here is focused on him. Mary's purification becomes Jesus' presentation. And Jesus' presentation becomes Simeon's song of welcome and Anna's words of wisdom as they invite all of us to welcome this baby Jesus into our own arms. He's truly the one who fulfills our deepest longing. Amen. Amen. We rise to tell the story of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us for Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he arose again according to the scriptures, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who is called by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Beloved, let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Good and gracious God, we come to you this morning praying for your church, for this beloved community called Zion, for our in-town brothers and sisters, and for every gathering of believers in every nook and cranny on this planet. We pray that you would indeed fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, Daddy. We pray that by the power of your Spirit, our deepest longing would indeed be fulfilled in Jesus. Give us lips to sing and hearts to praise the gift of our salvation in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, we come to you this day praying for those in need. We think of those who are experiencing houselessness, emotional distress, struggling with addiction. We pray for the Merzog family. We've had another bit of a curveball thrown, and the, the apartment we thought they would be moving into soon isn't available. So now they're waiting for a new building that will be completed later this summer. We pray that you give them patience. We pray also that you would open every door necessary to bring the father and husband from, from Afghanistan here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are ill. We think especially of Kenny and Brian and Nick, Richard and Mark and Tracy and Melina and Sheila, Don Wilson's great-granddaughter Madeline, and Mark Sandy's friend Don. We pray also for the homebound, thinking especially of Mark. Wrap your arms of love around these people. Hold them close to your heart. Assure them of your presence. Touch them with your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who are celebrating this day. We remember especially the birthdays of Russ Black, Linda Hastings, and Karen Schmidt. We ask that you would continue to pour every good gift of grace into their lives and ours. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray for our world and our leaders. Give our leaders wisdom. Give them the courage to do what is right. Give them the insight to apply their authority wisely and well. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we command all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord.
He rides to sing the offertory. Father, 
be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And be the sound of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, to remember me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen.
We rise to sing Simeon's song of welcome from our gospel reading this morning. Thank you. 